His name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 3. The book of Revelation chapter 3. And today we'll be looking at verses 14 through 22. While you turn there, I'll say a few words of introduction. Throughout Scripture, there are many people who are part of the covenant community, but are not actually truly part of the covenant community. Romans chapter 9, verse 6, the Apostle Paul says that not all Israel is Israel. And you can see this. You can see it throughout history, you can see it throughout the redemptive narrative, that whether it's Israel coming out of Egypt into the wilderness, and the myriads of people unbelieving of God falling in the wilderness, die. Because what? They don't believe the promise. Or you can see it again, they get into the land of Canaan. And they forsake the Lord and pursue the Baals and the Asherahs and all the rest. And it ends with them being exiled. Because those who are part of the covenant do not act or believe the covenant and they live in idolatry. This is not simply an Old Testament thing. You remember 1 John actually ends with those words, little children, keep yourself from idols. You'll remember Judas. You'll remember Simon, the magician. You'll remember Diotrephes in 3 John. That there are many people who are part of the visible church who are not part of the invisible church. There are many people who profess Jesus but do not possess Jesus. In our passage today, we come to a stark text. One of the Joys and sorrows of preaching Lexo Continua just through the books is that we hit every text. And today we see a church that is attached to Jesus, but simply in name and nothing more. It's this church that Jesus comes and speaks and exhorts. And it's from this passage that the King of Kings exhorts you and me this morning. Let me pray, and we'll read, and we'll get started. Let's pray and ask for God's help as we approach this passage. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, this is your word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And so we pray, speak, O Lord, for your servants listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. This is the word of the living God. Pay careful attention to it. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot, Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself in the shame of your nakedness, and it may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. The grass withers, 
and the flower falls, but the Word of God endures forever. May write its truth on our hearts. Well, brothers and sisters, today I have a proposition and two points. The proposition, what is Christ exhorting you and I to? We are to follow Christ. We are to follow Christ, not being lukewarm and deceived. And we are to follow Christ, living in communion with Him. We are to follow Christ, not being lukewarm and deceived. And we are to follow Christ, living in communion with Him. So we are to follow Christ, not being lukewarm and deceived. See how Jesus opens this passage in verse 14. He says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Today we come to the final of seven churches. And there's a great deal to learn from Jesus in these exhortations, as I hope you have gathered over these churches and these sermons. But one peculiar thing is that as we open Laodicea, it begins on a similar note to which it began. The church of Ephesus had left her first love. It ends with a church of Laodicea, a church that isn't passionate, a church that isn't for, isn't against. It's just existing. It's adding Jesus onto their already perfect lives. It's like Jesus is a cherry on top of an ice cream sundae. He's just there. Geographically, Laodicea was situated 100 miles east of Ephesus, between Hierapolis and Colossae. It was on a higher elevation than both of those particular towns, and this town becomes critical for trade and communications in the province. The city itself lay on the southern plateau, a half mile square, and a few hundred feet above the Locust Valley. One peculiar thing geographically that will come into play in this particular passage is that Hierapolis, the northern city to Laodicea, had hot water, which was thought to have medicinal effects. And Colossae had cold water, which was thought to be refreshing. Whereas Laodicea had no good water source itself. However, it had to pipe it in. It supplied its water from a town uh, in Denzili, six miles south, via an aqueduct. And as you can imagine, when they aqueducted the water in, it became full of minerals, undrinkable, and lukewarm. Christ takes their geographical location and applies it to them spiritually. But before he does that, he tells you about himself. And did you see how he refers to himself? He says, referring to himself, he says, the amen, the faithful and true witness. I want you to see that Christ uses two adjectives for his witness. They are, his witness is faithful. It's, 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 it's uh, bringing together everything in truth and it's, and it's accurate. Christ is set out as the one who is to be believed over every other. He set out as the one that you are to believe over your very own heart. You'll see, we'll see in verse 17, they are being deceived, but Christ says that you and I need to listen to Him. His very being is defined as the Amen. The one who is true. It comes from the Hebrew root, to be true. Christ is the very one who in His very person, everything about Jesus is true. There's no falsehood. In the midst of all the lies of the world, all the deceptions of the heart, those who He speaks to may be deceived, but He is never deceived. His eyes, as chapter 1 say, they burn with fire. He sees through to the very truth of your being. And He speaks in accord. It is what Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true. And every man a liar. It is impossible for Christ to bear false witness. Moreover, he declares these words in verse 14. Did you see them? The beginning of God's creation. He's not speaking 
to Christ being the beginning of the first creation here. Because you remember that John, the very writer of the book of Revelation, when he begins his gospel, says that Jesus, this is John 1, verses 2, 3, and 4, it says that he was with God, he was God, it says he was in the beginning with God, then it says that he, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Everything in all of creation is made by Christ. But then Christ refers to himself as the beginning of God's creation. You say, what is he referring to? He's referring to what he's already said in Revelation 1.5. He is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the declaration of him being the, the declaration of him being the beginning of God's creation, is asserting that he is the supreme. The one that he's supreme, he's the one who is worthy of all God possesses, and he's the first fruits of the very new creation. Christ is the beginning of the new creation. He's the inauguration of eternal life. And here, this one who is life itself, the beginning of this new life, he comes to speak to dead and blind men. And hear what he says. Verses 15 and 16. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. He says, I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. We've often noted that Jesus begins his exhortation to churches with a commendation, a correction, and a promise. But the church at Laodicea receives no commendation. The only commendation that Jesus can tell them is that they are lukewarm, which is by no means a commendation. It is the one whose eyes are like burning fire, looks into the heart of this church and finds only nominality in their Christian faith. They don't hate Jesus, they don't live for Jesus. They don't have a passion for him. They just simply exist with Jesus, with Christian on their name. And I wonder if that sounds familiar to you. If it sounds like churches you may know, or perhaps your very own heart. That you live and Jesus is just simply there. He doesn't rule your life. He doesn't guide your life. Your works are not evidencing Him. But rather, you just like to have the name Christian. Jesus is pulling upon the manner in which the water was brought into the city, as I mentioned. And He delivers this devastating blow in verse 15. He says, says, I wish, would, is the word for I wish, that you were either cold or hot, I would that you were like Heropolis that has these, these hot springs that have medicinal effects. I would that your works were showing forth healing for those around you. Or that you were refreshing like the waters of Colossae, but instead you are devoid of any works that show forth your Savior. He says those words, verse 16, that I will spit you out of my mouth. He says, Your works as a Christian make me sick. I want you to grab that there is no apostasy from the truth that Jesus brings out about this church. It's not guilty of any foul heresy. Laodicea has, they're not following Jezebel as other churches. They're not charged with a Nicolaitan doctrine or deed. The whole sum of the word that Christ expresses about them is that they are lukewarm. Their lives show no evidence that they love or live for the Savior. I want you to know that for a church or a follower of Jesus, to recognize His divine claims, to see His infinite love in the gospel, to, uh, to ascertain His precious blood, His almighty giving of His Spirit, His sweet and holy service, His promised glory, and then not to respond with anything 
with no affection, no earnest desires, no devotion, no self-denying, no self-sacrificing spirit is ultimately insulting to the Savior. If we profess the gospel, we confess. But we have no life for that gospel. We do our Savior a disservice. And we make Him sick. You may wonder, Jonas, what did their works look like? And you get a view of it in verse 17. In verse 17, he says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. The source of Christ's sickness is their self deception. They thought about themselves in a completely wrong way. They deceived themselves. They idolized their prosperity. They believed that God must love them because they do so well in life. It sounds a lot like a lot of TV preachers. But this illusion, and if you have a footnote in your Bible, probably says Hosea chapter 12, verse 8. Jesus is alluding to and quoting Hosea in this verse. When Hosea writes of the northern Israel, which had forsaken the Lord and gone into idolatry, they said in Hosea chapter 12, verse 8, Ah, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they cannot find in me iniquity or sin. And Hosea tells them that they are engaging in idolatry and they have forsaken the Lord. And he says that God has in truth found them not rich but worthless in verse 11. Jesus tells this church that they are at the very point of utter rejection like northern Israel itself. Just as God's people had forsaken him in the past, this church was forsaking him in the present. And brothers and sisters, they thought themselves on the very verge of heaven and they were on the precipice of hell. And it was all evidenced by their lives. Would that you and I would examine our lives today They thought they would just add Jesus on to their already perfect lives. They they have wealth, they have health, but they better just add Jesus on as a get out of hell free card. Pray a prayer, walk an aisle, and you're good to go. They thought that Jesus, that's all he required. Christ does not call his people to simply add him on to their life. He calls His people to find their life in Him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says that Christ Himself is the believer's life. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The believer does not find Jesus to simply be a part and parcel of their life. The believer finds Christ to be the totality of the sphere in which they exist. He himself is the believer's life. He's the sum, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end of the Christian's existence. And we can be so easily deceived, can't we? To think that our lives are consistent so much more. Or driving the coolest, living in the best place, having money in the bank. It's not what your life consists in. And as you find your identity in everything that you are and what you possess, Jesus says you are deceived. The Christian finds their identity 
in Him. And Christ calls to Laodicea, and He calls to us today. to examine the deception of our hearts. Wherein does your life consist? The totality of it. What is the end, the telos, the love, the goal, the thing for which you live? It'll tell you what you revolve around. You could ask yourself more pointedly, What do your nightmares consist of? That'll tell you what you love. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, that there is no one better to exhort you today. That is Jesus here. Jesus, the one who is faithful and true, the one who can see the deception of your heart and yet still comes to you, the one who himself while you may be poor, while you may be blind, while you may be running after all the idols, all the tangible things of this world, Jesus Himself comes in this passage, the one who has risen from the dead, the new creation, the one who gives new life, and He offers you life. There is no one better to speak to you. There is no one better to reveal your condition. If you have fallen in 1 John 2, 15, to have loved the world, Christ calls you to love Him. This phrase in verse 16, that I will spit you out of my mouth, is actually, uh, the word for will is about to. The precise, precise meaning is, I am about to spit you out of my mouth implying that Jesus is coming with an interval of time for you, that you might turn from your ways, that you might repent of your love of the world and turn to Christ in affection and love and be offered and given the life He promises. Brothers and sisters, We're to follow Christ. And this world is full of deception. Our hearts themselves will deceive us if left to ourselves. But Christ comes to you this morning as the prophet, the better prophet, the great prophet, who calls you out and to trust in Him. So we're to follow Christ, not being lukewarm and deceived, we're to follow Christ living in communion with Him. See what He says in verse 18. He says, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Here Jesus gives the solution. He not only gives the summons, but He gives the solution. Just as in the Old Testament when God's people would go astray, He would send them prophets to come to them. And here we have the great prophet coming and telling us the manner in which we are returned to the Lord our God. He has said what they need. What they need to be rich, toward God, what they need to be clothed in fine garments, what they need not to be ashamed or blind. And did you see what they need in verse 18? He says, I counsel you to buy from me. Your greatest need and my greatest need in the midst of all the deceivingness of our own hearts is to see the riches of Christ our Savior. It says that His riches are are immeasurable in Colossians and Ephesians chapter 3. He is without bounds. They are impossible to measure because they are infinite as His very being is infinite. It it says actually in that very passage in Ephesians that He will give us according to His riches, not out of His riches, but according to meaning that if you would be rich towards God, 
If you would be clothed not in the filthy garments of Joshua and Zechariah chapter 3, but if you would be clothed in fine garments, if you would not be ashamed before the presence of God, what you need is not found in this world. It is found in Christ alone. It is found in the totality of His being. And in reality, the Laodiceans, their hearts are crying for meaning in this world, and they're finding it in all the wrong places. And Jesus comes, and He holds forth His gospel to them. He was rich and became poor, that, they, that in His poverty they might be made rich. He was clothed with the trains of glory in heaven, and He came and took upon Himself the form of a servant, that they might be clothed with glory. He Himself came to those who are blind and dead, the one who can see to give them sight. The very, the very grace of His gospel is evident in His offer. And I want you to know that Jesus does not simply point out your deception of heart. He comes to you with a solution. The solution. I want you to know that the Savior is full of pity for you. He's full of pity for those who are bound fast in sin and nature's light, as Wesley said. And His bowels of tenderness have not weakened for you, that you yourself may be deceived at this moment. But Christ in love knocks with His Word. And this very Word is able to give you life. You see what he says. He tells them of his love in verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. What I'm doing to you, Jesus says, is because I love you in Laodicea. And he says, so respond to it. So be zealous and repent. And he furthers this analogy of love when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. I want you to get the very first underlining thing here, is that Jesus is not coming and knocking at the door of unbelievers' hearts. Does he do that with the gospel? Yes. But in this passage, contrary to what hymns may be used for today, this passage, Jesus is coming to the church itself. He's coming to those who profess and possess His name. And He's telling them that they are the ones that are deceived. Not the outside world, but the church itself. And He's knocking at the door of the church of Laodicea. And I want you to just grasp, how is Jesus knocking? He's knocking with His Word. Christ comes to His people and offers them grace in His Word. Christ, the instrumentality of grace which Jesus uses for the good of His people is always found in the Bible. And in this Word, Jesus knocks to you. It is a call to be renewed in your devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. I dare say that as Christians, there is a vast temptation to have a grand emphasis on us having peace with God, being right with God. We overemphasize our justification and completely ignore our sanctification. And you see what Jesus is indicting this church for? It's not that they have justification wrong. He says, I know your works. He's indicting them that their justification is producing nothing in them. And I dare say that we are not too far from this tree. We are not too far from those who simply love to have the forgiveness of sins, and we simply stop there. 
Our king cares about the works of his people. And he cares about your works. You know, it says in that 2 Corinthians 8 passage that God loves a cheerful giver. Did you know in Christ you're made right with God? But did you know that you can do things that make God smile? That you, by good works, can make your Father in heaven glad? It is glorious. You'll notice that Jesus' call here is to a holy life. But I want you to see that a holy life is a communing life. Verse 20, he says, He stands at the door and knocks with His word. And He says, If you hear His voice, open the door. And notice what He'll do. I will come in to Him and eat with Him and He with me. I will commune with Him. If you will but turn to Christ, that you will but live and love the Savior, you will find sweet communion with the Savior. It is that Isaiah 58 passage where if you pour yourself out for the Lord, you'll find the Lord pouring Himself into you. And Jesus ends with promise. He ends saying, the one who conquers. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat with my father on his throne. And he calls, saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want you to know that Christ will more than compensate His people for their sorrows. That the things that you have endured for the loss of Jesus, that they are not loss, but they are what Paul says is gain. To live is Christ, though in chains, to die is gain. I want you to know that it is not, as I said last week, a sorrowful thing to be a Christian. It is such a happy thing to be a Christian. It is the man, happy is the man who does not walk in the way of the wicked, in the counsel of the wicked, the way of sinners, the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And Jesus says that for that person who conquers, who holds fast to him, who loves the Savior himself who conquered and lives with him, that Jesus will cause him to rule and reign. But if they don't renew their zeal, the warning is implicit, isn't it? If they don't renew their zeal, they will show that they never were actually in Christ, but all that they loved was the world and not Christ. If you live for the world... If you love the world, the chances are that you're not the Lord's. If you're a Christian this morning, do not find your security, your worth, your identity in this world. Rather, find your security, your worth in the one who says, hold to me. Hold fast to Jesus and His wondrous works and it's but a very short time and you will say that phrase, to live with Christ and to die is gain. But if you're not a Christian this morning, the Lord Jesus has inaugurated a new creation. He has defeated death, risen from the grave, and He offers you life beyond the grave this morning. Christ calls you to come and be made right with Him. To have ears that hear the voice of the King of Kings and to turn in faith. And enjoy this promise forevermore. Well, brothers and sisters, we are to follow Christ, not being lukewarm and deceived. And we are to follow Christ living in communion with Him. Let's pray together.
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, how good it is to sit under the words of this King. We pray, Lord, that you would show us even now the deceptive nature of our hearts. And we pray that you would cause your people to run and love and hold fast to and live for the Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.